Welcome to another online program from the Adams County Historical Society. My name is Antigone Ladd, and I serve on the board here at the Society, and I'm delighted to be your host for this program. We've been working very hard to bring you more programs rather than less during this time of pandemic. We've dipped into Adams County's rich history from the dinosaur age through the Revolutionary War to the Civil War to the present. And we've covered topics as diverse as medicine, photography, and taverns. So we hope that you have found something that appealed to your sense of history and the things that you're interested in learning about. If not, we hope you've had fun because we have enjoyed doing the research and putting the programs together. If you'd like to help us continue these programs, it's very simple to make a donation. There's a red button at the bottom of your screen. It's safe, it's secure, and a donation of any size is much appreciated. Tonight's program will be on Introduction to Military Records Research. It came from the work of the Historical Society's Committee on Military Research. The group was organized to build a database of veterans from all wars and peacetime, people who lived or worked in Adams County. And in doing that research, we found how difficult it was because we went beyond the tools of general genealogical research to digging a little further into military records. So we have designed a class on that topic, and tonight we're going to offer that class to you online and hope that you will enjoy it. I'd like to introduce you to our co-presenter this evening, who is Larry Garns, a man who worked at the National Archives, our nation's largest repository of all records, not just military. And Larry has regaled our committee meetings with stories of his adventures with people doing research at the National Archives. And I'm so hoping that he will share some of those stories this evening. So I'd like to turn the program over to Larry Garns, who will introduce himself hopefully with a few adventures of what goes on at the National Archives and how he ha happened to work there. Larry, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. My name's Larry Garns. I'd like to thank Antigone for having me uh, co-host this program. Uh, I spent some considerable time at the National Archives, uh, not exactly by design. I had been in private industry and I wanted to pad my government service so I could retire. So I thought I would apply to a few government agencies. And I had a sphere interest in the National Archives and the Library of Congress. Fortunately, the archives uh, interviewed me and hired me. And I have to tell you, I don't know how many people get sort of like their dream job, but this was like letting a kid loose in a candy store. Uh, it was a very prestigious building. It was a kind of a prestigious title, and uh, I feel very lucky to have been able to uh, spend the last 12 years of my employment there. It was an interesting place to work. Contrary to what you hear, and I've heard this repeatedly when uh, people come into the archives, someone has told them that whatever they're looking for is at the National Archives because we have everything. I hate to burst people's bubble, but the National Archives only houses federal government records. So I really had to disappoint the gentleman that come in and asked for his fourth grade report card. I have no idea why he needed his report card, whether it was especially a good one or maybe it was his last one. I don't know. But we get all kinds of odd requests that don't apply because people have been misinformed or... Uh, well, I spent my last 12 years at the archives working on some interesting project, interacting with some seriously famous people and everyday people. And uh, it was just every day was different and kind of interesting. I never lost my zeal to go in there because there's always something going to be interesting or laughable. Or to start with this position, they had us, uh, they give us some training so we'll be able to assist people. My background was in genealogy, which. Uh, took off like crazy after Mr. Haley went nuts on us. And the other one was Civil War research, which uh, having grown up in Chambersburg here and now residing in Gettysburg, I had a lifelong interest in. And you need Civil War records, the National Archives is the place to go. Thank you, Larry. My interest personally is in World War II. And my story is that I discovered that my mother had saved all the letters that my father had written to her during World War II. His older brother 
who served in New Guinea in the Pacific Theater in the Medical Corps, her younger brother, who was served in the D-Day invasion, and her older brother, who was in the Army Air Corps and served in the China-Burma-India Theater. She had saved all of their letters from all over the world and never said a thing to us as kids. When I got those letters, I could not stop reading. It has taken me years, but I have uh, transcribed all the letters. I have added photos from the family photo albums to um, show people what the family members looked like in those years. And I am proud to say that all of the military letters are now in the Library of Congress as part of the Veterans History Project. I was very proud of being able to do that. In the meantime, I was able to make digital copies to save with all, share with all of our relatives. But that got me started in researching military records. I had no genealogical experience at all and fell into it and have not stopped since. My current project with the committee is building a database for the uh, historical society of World War I veterans. And there are over a thousand people who served in World War I. And three of us are working on this project and working many, many months already just to collect their information. So with that as a starter, let's look at what we're going to learn in this class. In this class, we originally designed it as a course to be offered to members of the Historical Society over a five-week period. Our intention was to give you tools to do military research and help you use those tools one piece at a time. So we would start with the very basic, go up to the more complex, and there would be somebody to help you. Our plan was to have a five-week course. Each week we would introduce one topic. We would talk for half an hour in a prepackaged lecture where we had all the material organized, and then turn you loose on the computers or in the files of the Historical Society while a committee member was available to assist you in get if you got stuck on the computer or you couldn't find a record you were looking for. Obviously, with the pandemic, we are not able to do the live course, so we have kept the slides, and we're going to walk you through the course tonight. Um, our plan is to give you the handouts for the class, which will give you even more information than you'll get online, and hope that you'll be able to use some of this information as you need it to do your own research. If not, we're available to answer questions. So let's walk through what we organize. Here we have photographs from the Civil War, previously World Wars I and II. You can go back if you like. This class will be uh, recorded tonight. It will be put up on YouTube, and you can go back over it if you found a topic you wanted to look over again. Or you could sign up for our class, or you can just download the handouts from the website. Okay, let's get started with online databases, which is the easiest way to start. Number one, we always tell our students that you need to come prepared if you're looking up a specific veteran with as much information as you know about the veteran. If you can find a social security number, if you know the person's date of birth, place of birth, if you know anything about his military service, where he was stationed, any of that will help you go farther and faster in your research. And I'll ask Larry what kinds of questions he got from people who came to the National Archives looking for research. Did they come prepared? All right. People come in with various degrees of preparation for this. Some of them have an extensive uh, amount of information. They just want to round things out. Other people have hardly any information. And some people come in with erroneous information. And then there's a few that walk in that think that they're going to give us a name and we're going to provide them with their entire genealogical tree and every record ever made for their particular person. And they're almost irate when we tell them it doesn't work that way. In the genealogy department, people that wanted a complete family tree, we had to explain to them that we don't have the trees, but we have the leaves. We have the different information that can help you fill out the trees. All kinds. Okay. So let's not do that. We started our suggestions with 
finding the basics, date of birth, date of death, location. There are cemetery resources, which are very good places. If your veteran you're looking for is buried overseas, you go to the American Battle Monuments Commission, which has all the cemetery records for those people buried abroad. If you want to look for someone who's in a military cemetery, there's a National Military Administration, which is part of Veterans Affairs, and here's the website for that one. Civilian graves you will find on the commercial website called Find a Grave. It's a very easy site to use. Um, I was surprised because I first used it about 10 years ago and it was very basic at the time. Today, Find a Grave includes things that people have added to their relatives' websites. People have put in photographs. Some people have added family trees. Some people have added biographies of their relatives. So if you're looking for a person, you might find his entire family history there, which would be a wonderful site. For local cemeteries here in Adams County, the Historical Society has a vast collection of records. So this is your basic information. If you didn't have all of the information to start with, this is a good place to begin your work. If you know anything about the military, uh, and the branch of service that your relative served in, or the person you're doing the study on, each of the military services has its own museums, it has photographs, it has artifacts, it has uh, unit histories. The handout that we have prepared, I didn't want to put all this on a slide because it would be too tedious to go through it. The handout gives you the websites of each of the military services where you can get details of that particular branch. Fold 3 is a military records uh, research online database. Unfortunately, you have to have a membership for it. The Historical Society has a, a um, subscription to it, so if you can get on their site, if we can all get you all into the building, then you have access there. Many libraries you will find use Fold 3, but Fold 3 has taken military records and made them available on site. If you don't mind spending the money, it's a wonderful resource. Now, why didn't I start with Ancestry? Well, the problem with Ancestry is it has names from not only the United States, but from many other nations as well. If you put in the name James Smith, for instance, you'll get over 300,000 hits. And then you have to scroll down page after page after page. If you know the person's date of birth, that'll narrow the search down. If you know the person's date of death, if you know the person's hometown, or where that person was married, any more information you can put in as a filter will bring you to Ancestry much easier. But I think it's a lot to ask for that you start with Ancestry, which is a wonderful resource, but it's too big. And navigating through it takes days. I've been working on over a thousand names for the World War I database, and I find the same thing. If I go in and put in a name that's very common, I then have to go through sometimes 300 pages looking to see if I can find the military records for an individual or a marriage record or something similar. So anyway, that's why we don't suggest you start with Ancestry. Get the basics first and then see if you can narrow it down. Any thoughts, Larry? Spouse. Spouse is also helpful. Now let's turn to the National Archives, which is a treasure trove of information, but for many people it's a very confusing resource, and so we have a person here who has worked at the facility and knows how to find his way through. The National Archives and Record Administration, NARA, is the government agency charged with storing and preserving all records generated by the U.S. government. The NARA system is usually just referred to as the National Archives. NARA is responsible for and houses a great many military records. Some of the examples are listed on the slide. Most of these records are located in three locations. The National Archives Original Building in Washington, D.C., also known as A1. Archives 2, a subsequent archives, it's located out in College Park, Maryland, and the National Personnel Records Center 
for military records in St. Louis, Missouri. In comparison to other government websites, www.archives.gov is fairly easy to navigate. Certain records can be requested online or by fax or mail. Other records may only be located in one of the aforementioned branches and may require a visit. NARA as an agency does not provide a great number of records online. Their main job is the preservation of these records. However, NARA has partnered with Ancestry.com and Fold3.com to digitize certain record groups for mutual benefit. Fold3 specializes in military records. These are ongoing and long-term commitments. This is an example of Antigone's relatives. Okay, this is my uncle, William Left Terrace, and I just want to show you what kinds of information would be available if you can find the enlistment record. They actually have the terms of his enlistment, where he enlisted, which was Baltimore, um, his citizenship. He is um, a naturalized citizen of the United States. When he was born, he, his birthplace, which was Greece, his education level, his work status, his military rank, and his serial number, which if you didn't know it, this is a great place to find it. So all of this is online for some people. This is an example of a U.S. Army service card. Again, I'm, I was not terribly familiar with this, but it's just chock full of information. Okay, on this one, when you're looking for these, they are invaluable because on this one little card, which looks like it's probably an index size card, they have the enlistment date. They have where the person enlisted. This gentleman enlisted at Fort Slocum in New York, November 6th, 1914. They have his hometown and his age, which I love, listed 22 and 8 12th years. His organization, you can see all the military units that this person served in. Now, I will ask Larry to verify this, but it seems to me that in World Wars One and Two, and currently, people are moved around in different military units as they are needed. Whereas in the Civil War, those of you who have done Civil War research will find that many people signed up with a unit, say a regiment of a thousand people from a particular hometown or sometimes from a business that they worked in, and they would stay together in that unit throughout their service enlistment period. Unless, Larry? Unless their unit was severely decimated and had to be combined due to attrition. That's mostly the only way you were moved around in the Civil War. And But this one is different. So if you look at the organization here, you will see that this person served in one unit for, uh, to May 15th. He's in <clears throat> another area. He goes to Texas. Um, then he goes with another group until the, his discharge. So he has three different assignments. They list his military status, his grades. Uh, if he had been in a particular engagement, uh, a major battle, that would be listed here. His wounds would be listed. And then they have his honorable discharge. If you can find this card on one piece of paper, you've got a ton of information. Unit histories. Uh, these are not always done by the government. Sometimes they were done by the individual units got together. Or sometimes they were done by individual posts where a person, that unit, trained or so forth. These are very nice because they have photographs and so forth, but uh, there's not a unit history for every unit. You just have to kind of see what's there. But most always these are going to be located in the Archives 2 branch at College Park, Maryland. Do you actually get to see them and touch them? Oh, yeah. You can, you can request them. This is like any record. You can request it. They'll bring it to you. You spend as much time as you want to with it, make copies or whatever, and then you return it. That's what the archive does. Thank you. <laughs> Be prepared for some challenges. Spelling inaccuracies is the number one initial problem in searches. There's either inadvertent spelling transcriptions, just typos. There's no accounting for the number of reasons spelling inaccuracies exist, but they are the number one challenge. Information in military records may vary. Unit records. 
most of the time, like I said, the unit records are, are done by a post or a unit, and they don't have anything really to do with uh, actual records. So you might find some very, uh, very information there. Privacy legislation may prevent information from being shared. There's usually a time frame associated with records on individuals that if you're not next of kin or that person, you have to wait a certain period of time before it becomes public domain. Larry, I have a question for you because when you came in today, we were talking about some of the names I had trouble finding in my World War I database. And you looked at the name I gave me, gave you, and you said, the reason you can't find this guy is he has two first names, which could be juxtaposed. Missing, yeah, juxtaposed. And so he may not be Charles Jones, Jones. yeah, whatever. And you said, try flipping his name. There's all kinds of little tricks you pick up after you've seen that they work. Sometimes they go by initials. Sometimes okay. you might see this in some military records. It's uh, the first name, then it says NMN, last name, no middle name. You think they would leave it blank, but not the government. <laughs> all right. The last one is not all military records have survived intact. Brace yourself. Archivist's worst nightmare. In July of 1972, a catastrophic fire rocked the NPRC in St. Louis, Missouri. This is a block-long building. The entire sixth floor burned. It burned for three days. It was All the records on that sixth floor were completely destroyed. The fifth floor suffered extensive water damage. What was destroyed? The loss to the Federal Military Records Collection was staggering and included almost an 80% loss of U.S. Army personnel records discharged between 1912 and 1960. So that's World Wars I, that's one and two, two and Korea. Korea and Korea. Uh, that's the bulk of our aging servicemen now, or deceased servicemen. 75% loss are U.S. Air Force personnel between 1947 and 1964. A lot of Army Reserve personnel and other various records. Active duty from the late 50s to 1964. According to us, uh, fire is the archivist's four-letter F word. Once an individual record is destroyed or gone, it's gone forever. None of the records that were destroyed in the fire had duplicate copies made or had been microfilmed. So. There's no index to these records prior to the fire, and millions were on loan to the Veterans Administration. This makes it extremely difficult to precisely determine which records were lost. There is some reclamation projects going, trying to root through the charred remains, and which is almost impossible. And the waterlogged records are being dried out with state-of-the-art technique, but uh, it all comes down to time, money, and it's, it's, it's just a severe tragedy for everybody involved. Let's move on to the next section where you continue building the story of your family, your home, your census information, and newspaper options. Let's look at the census, which any good genealogist is familiar with. A lot of people just starting out have no idea what they're looking at. This is a sample of a census form from 1930 you will see that they capture not only name and address and family members, but a lot of smaller questions, which if you read across the top, let's see if I have them here closer, you will see this paper is like two legal pages in length. The 1930 census and the 1910 census are the two that I explored the most and found that they asked very different questions each year beyond the basics. They will have questions about your citizenship, your ability to speak the language. Uh, they will ask personal questions about family members. And each year will be a little bit different. But I was able, to, through the census, to learn some fascinating things. Let me go back to that previous page. You will find that the census takers generally are traveling up and down a, an individual street. So if you read down the left-hand side where they will give the address, you will find that you are looking at an apartment building, for example, 
they will have the people who live on each floor, one after another, after another, after another. So you will find who are the neighbors of the people you are researching. You will find if they lived in an ethnic neighborhood. Fascinating things you can discern just from the street addresses and the locations. I even found one, I have to tell you this one was great, the 1920 census was done at a mental institution that I found in Omaha, Nebraska. They had all the patients listed mm -hmm. and all the information on them. You'll find that in prisons, too. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Didn't they're think all, about that. They're all there. So the U.S. Census is a source of great information. It will, however, have some errors. Here's what a filled-out census looks like. Very difficult to zero in on it because of all the information. So let me take a small section to show you some things that I learned from this one. This is the 1910 census where I was looking up my grandmother's brothers and sisters. And what I found in this little piece from Haverhill, Massachusetts, was that this family, father, mother, and three children, what I learned is that Athanasia Sagris, who is the wife, was asked how many children had she born, and she had three. They asked the question that year, of those three children, how many are now living? One. She never talked about the children that she lost. But that immediately sent me on a search to see if they had been children that lived into age one or two, or if she had lost them earlier on. And you can find that information by doing your research. But this is just an example of digging into the census. Look on the all the way on the left-hand side here of the census form, and it says Locust Street. So here is the street address. If you read up and down the big page, you will see that they're on the same street. You will see who else is living in that area. Here are the ages of the people. Um, here's whether they are, are speaking Greek, whether they were where they were born, etc. Larry? The first two or three columns there, one you have says Locust Street. Yes. That wasn't required information. The census taker was kind enough just to put that there, probably noting the grid that he was on. That, that's not a question that's asked. That's just information that shows up that's really helpful when you have a street address or Absolutely. a number. But most of it's like, how many, what number dwelling you went to today what is the total dwelling the first so many columns are not actually information over here that are, are really for the census they're mostly for the census taker okay but again if you can get a street name and a number that might be the clue that unlocks your door absolutely see in this one you see head of household wife and daughter mm -hmm. then you see two other names in this household these are lodgers. Mm -hmm. These are people who are in the same apartment or building. It's 32 and a half mm -hmm. Locust Street, so I'm guessing it's an apartment. Mm -hmm. um, and there are two people lodging in with this family. They have their ages. And here's where I will tell you about the discrepancies in age. I don't believe everything that everybody tells the census taker. My grandmother used to always add a year or two to her age. Other people <laughs> subtract five or six years. Other people tell you that uh, when they came over, this is not fact-checked against anything. So it's whatever you tell the census taker is what's recorded. Now, newspaper data is fascinating. Uh, I have found in my studies for the World War I database that in many cases I cannot find the location of where a person was buried. They did not show up in find a grave. They didn't show up in ancestry. So then I hit newspapers.com, which is one of many online newspaper databases. Now, this one is a subscription service, unfortunately. But when you go in, if you can find the person's obituary, it frequently will tell you the date the person died and where he was buried. So if you can't get it from a data source, you can get it from a newspaper story. Um, and there are fascinating stories in there, too. You will find many local newspapers will give lengthy, uh, not just obituaries, but biographies of the person. 
you'll learn a lot of great stories about the people that you're looking up. So don't discount the newspapers. They have wonderful information. Now, the genealogy tools are growing every day. When I first tried to use Ancestry.com, it was a much smaller database. Today, I type in a name and look for a military record, and I get the British service, I get the Scottish service, the Canadian military. Um, they are growing exponentially. My Heritage uh, is another good one. Family Search is the one that is, that's the Mormon Church-based one. That one is completely free. Um, there are dozens of others. These are just names of some databases. Find the one that fits the kind of search you want to do. Find the one that has a layout that you're comfortable with. Uh, in our work on the World War I group, there are three of us. We divided them up, and each of us is using a different database for ancestry type tools. And each of us is adding more information to the other person's records. So each of them may have more information, so it's useful to check several of them. Yearbooks are now available mm -hmm. online. That's a wonderful source. Um, if you want to see what your relatives look like in high school, there you are. Those, again, are by subscription, but there is so much today that's increasingly available. The other thing that the United States did was we had draft registrations. Larry, do you want to tell them a little bit about draft registration cards? Okay, the World War I draft registration was pretty extensive. They had like three or four waves of it, but uh, it's a basic card of information that you, it's like selective service. You registered for the draft. Didn't mean you were going to be drafted, but it was mandatory. So the fascinating part is it's mostly filled out in cursive writing. Sometimes you can find your relative's actual signature on here, and it's just date of birth, where they lived, height, complexion, occupation, and so forth. And uh, So it's a very good resource if you can find one. This one's uh, one Ancestry and a uh, you know, microfilm at the archives, which is kind of a drag if you're not into microfilm. So. And then they were, so, uh, that was the entire World War I draft system. World War II was a little different. World War II was so extensive that they never they they did not retain the uh, the actual cards for enlisted people that actually served there. There was a fourth World War II draft registration called the Old Man's Draft, or it was number four. This is anybody who was over 44, had previously been a veteran, or they were just required to register. It was sort of like the last stopgap measure in case we were invaded or so forth. Most of the people you'll find in here, some of them have World War I draft card. My grandfather did. Uh, but most of them you'll notice that are of age over 40. This gentleman's 60. He's at the very end of the spectrum. But it gives you a snapshot of what that person, where they lived, age, spouse, so forth. So it's, it's kind of interesting just to have this because it's, it's one docu one page document. So the World War II draft cards were not lost in the fire. They just were never saved. They were never saved. There was just, I don't know why. Uh, Probably there were too many of them. Uh, there, was, there were millions and millions and millions of them. So. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to move on to now you have more information on their military service, if you're able to find it, and now you know the obstacles. What other sources do you have? Now that you've built the basic platform for the veteran story, you need to flesh it out. Here's where you need stories. And the best resource I can think of is the Historical Society. I would recommend that you go first to the website to look at how many collections are available within the Adams County Historical Society that might give you clues to this person's life. There are family records. And I don't mean just a list. There are family histories. There are family collections. The county courthouse has turned over many of its records to the Historical Society for storage. There are also church records. There's an enormous amount of information you can gather from estate files, 
property records, tax records. When you get a chance, look at the movie that Adams County Historical Society has on its YouTube page. Andrew and Tim have done a video walking you through the collections. And the moment that sticks out in my memory is when they open a box that has documents in it about a World War I veteran, Walter Hess, and they pull out his medical bag from World War I. That's real. That's tangible. That's a piece of his life you can get excited about. Another time I was there, I was doing research on prisoner of war camps, and I found that on the second floor was a painting done by a German prisoner of the base, the camp that he was living in. It's a beautiful painting, and it's huge, and it became part of the story that I tell about the POW camps in the area. So much is available there that you owe it to yourself to take advantage of this rich resource. There are over a million artifacts, photographs, documents, histories, newspapers. Computer uh, service is available as well, where you can do research that you can't get on your machine at home. So I recommend highly getting the resources of the Historical Society to finish building the story of your veteran. The final part of our story is this one. What are you going to do with the information that you have collected from the census, from the military records, from the newspaper stories, from the biographies, the family trees? Are you going to save the stories? One of the best things you might do if you have a relative who is still alive, whose story you would like to capture, is get an oral history where you ask questions of the individual and tape record them and save them for your family and for future generations to know their stories. Why is this important? Well, how did I feel finding the World War II letters of my uncles and my father that they never talked about their war experiences? When I asked my uncle Gus, why did, how did he feel about his military service? He looked at me very calmly and said, all I was doing was my job. They asked me to go and I did. And I'm like, where's the drama? Where's the, the theatrics? Where's all the, um, glory that I see on television? To Uncle Gus, it was just doing his job. Well, there are many people like that who have not shared their stories and it's time to do some oral histories. The best tool you can get, and I have only listed a few options for you here, but we have a complete handout from the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. In the handout, or you can go online to the Library of Congress and get a copy as well, they will give you the, a suggested location set up, how to physically set up the table, how close to sit to the person, what kinds of recording equipment to use, um, how to test the equipment, and they give you suggested questions that you might ask the person about their military service. They literally make it easy for you with a script and tools for doing safe and accurate recordings. However, there are also commercial companies that are doing the same thing for you. Some of these are free. Some of them will charge. They, too, are trying to preserve the stories, and they are available. I have listed a couple of names here. There are more listed on the handout. Story Trust, Narrative Trust, Transcription Star. These are all sites where if you don't know how to do an oral history, someone can come to you or you can go to your studio. It's a very interesting service, and I'm delighted that it's available. Now, the Veterans History Project, I talked about submitting the letters from my relatives. Here is my Uncle Bill's collection at the Library of Congress. They are not putting all the photographs and the letters directly available online. That would be massive. What they have done is they have listed here the types of materials that I turned over. They list a little bit about the individual name, home state, notes, born in Gardiki, Greece, um, 
war or conflict. It's World War II. He's a veteran. The dates of service uh, drafted. The unit he served with, First Field Hospital in Milne Bay in the Pacific, in New Guinea. And then they have a list of the resources that I gave them. Mm -hmm. I gave them a manuscript. I gave them a disc with all the letters and the manuscript. I also gave them the original letters and the original photographs that he had. Wonderful stories for my uncle. One of his letters, he says to my family back home that they can stop sending him film for his camera because his camera has rusted in the jungles of New Guinea. It was so hot that the cameras just literally rusted out. He said there's only one man in our company that still has a working camera, and so I'm, we're all giving him our film. He's taking pictures. He's sending them home and getting his relatives to send 20 copies of every photograph that they think is worth keeping and he's going to distribute them to us. Hmm. So I have found some of my uncle's photographs on other websites that other family members have posted. But this is what the Library of Congress can do for you. So that is another way to save your story, is the Veterans History Project. Find a Grave, I mentioned earlier as a site. Here is an example of a website that has taken on contributions from the family. Someone chose to put in for Eugene Sterner not only the basics, but they added his biography. And they have pictures here. Sometimes you will find pictures of the individuals. You can submit them to find a grave. Now, what if you have artifacts? What if you have diaries, photos, uniforms? Here are two friends of mine who have their father's World War I uniform, hat, boots, and photographs. They donated them to the American Legion, and when the Legion didn't have a place to display them, they moved them across the street to the Carroll County Historical Society, where they are on display. Um, suggestions for you. What about writing an article about what you learned about your relative that you were researching? The Adams County Historical Society would love your article. If you are a long writer, you might do a story for the magazine. If you are a short writer and want to do just a few paragraphs, we'll put it up on our blog page. There are lots of places where you can share your story. Make copies of anything that you find. You can save them now digitally. You don't have to print the photographs. Put them on a thumb drive and give them to everybody as a Christmas present. I did this one year for my family when I found a lot of photographs for my husband's Korean War experience. I made digital thumb drives for everybody with all the photos and labels on all the pictures which we identified. And to be fun, I went out and purchased a different thumb drive with a different figure on it for each person. For our grandson, who is a computer geek, we got a little computer. For another um, grandson, we got a robot. For uh, Ginny, who is a little girl who loves dogs, we got a, do a puppy. Get a thumb drive that's fun and put the files on there, and it will make a wonderful and very personal uh, Christmas gift. The younger mm -hmm. generation may not appreciate all the work that you've done. That's right. They won't now, but they will later. Larry is saying, absolutely. If you have photographs, please know that if you donate a photograph to a historical society or any organization, if you don't have it labeled with date, location, and names of people, they won't take it. Why? Because how are they going to catalog it? They don't know what year the photograph was, so how are, you know, if you can't help them with it, they have no use for it. So please, make, uh, make copies of any notes you may have. And, of course, the Veterans History Project, which I love personally. That's our story about how to do military research and what to do with it as a finished product. Here I have the names of the individuals who are serving on our committee right now. Our project was to organize this class and make it available to any members of the Historical Society. We hope that this program will be a good start on your research. 
If you would like to contribute anything to us or if you'd like to work with our committee, our next project is building a database of veterans from all wars. So far, we've spent six months on World War I, so God only knows how many years it will take us to do World War II. Job security. That's right. Uh, if you would like to join us, feel free to do so. My email address is on the slide to the right, Antigone Ladd at Tigrit with two T's, Corp. com. We thank you for joining our class tonight. We thank you for being interested in this subject. And if you'd like to help us in any way as a committee member, as a volunteer, we would love to hear from you. If you want to donate, please feel free. It'll help us keep the programs coming. Thank you for your time and attention. Good night.